Hello and welcome to today's program and thank you for joining us. I'm C. Virginia Fields, former Manhattan Borough President and currently the President and CEO of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS. The mission of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS is to educate, mobilize, and empower black leaders to meet the challenge of fighting HIV, AIDS, and other health disparities in their local communities. And today's program is part one of a two-part series. We'll, we will be talking about the connection between stigma and the high rate of HIV, how shame and fear of being ostracized inhibit open dialogue about risk factors, fuel misconceptions about how HIV is transmitted, discourages people from getting tested and seeking treatment, as well as preventing people from disclosing their HIV status to their intimate partners. So here today to discuss this important topic in part one is Cat Chairs, producer, director of the documentary, Ending Silence, Shame, and Stigma, HIV AIDS in the African American family. Cat Chairs is the founder and chief executive officer of Third Eye Films Incorporated. She is committed to using film and video production to enhance the lives of underserved and minority communities. And in addition to the production of high quality documentary films about matters of social import and just justice, Kat would also like to build Third Eye Films Inc. into a leading institution of teaching youth all aspects of media production through workshops, summer programs, and conduct classes on media literacy for teens and adults. Kat, thank you so much for joining me today and I'm just so excited about what you're now doing, and I'm glad that you've uh, given some time to come by today and talk about it. Uh, I'd like to say from the beginning that the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS just recently launched a stigma, or an anti-stigma actually, uh, campaign, and uh, we will be talking a little bit more about why we are doing that mm -hmm. and how it relates to the work that you're doing. But I'd like to get started just by asking you to tell us a little about the film sure. and what made you decide to focus on shame and stigma as it relates to HIV. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Fields, for having me as a guest on your show. I'm very um, honored to be here. And um, wow, uh, my journey with HIV and AIDS probably started actually when I was in high school. Uh, I'm uh, originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and I recently relocated here to the New York area. But I volunteered with a teen program uh, in high school uh, with Aid Atlanta called Ask Us. And that program would go around to cool schools and uh, different youth groups and educating people about HIV and AIDS. So that was kind of my initial sort of um, relationship, I guess, with the subject matter. And then in 1997, I did my first documentary on uh, street children in Ghana. And one of those um, uh, things that they were involved in was HIV prevention among street children. And in 2004, um, I was actually in graduate school out in California, and um, the statistics started coming out from the CDC uh, that particularly was talking about uh, the high HIV infection rate in uh, African American communities. But particularly alarming for me uh, was the uh, percentage in um, black women. Um, and so I'm reading about this, you know, um, as, as a student, and then also realizing that my hometown of Atlanta was actually higher than the national average. I think if it was about 67 or 68 percent of all new HIV infections were black women, I believe at the time that Atlanta was about 73 percent. And so reading about this, you know, from, uh, you know, from, you know, the other side of the country really alarmed me. And I thought, well, what is going on? What is this about? What are people doing about <laughs> yeah, it? Right? What, what are people doing about it? And um, so 
when, so I started thinking about doing some type of project at that point. And then I came back to Atlanta in 2005, and it was a topic of conversation amongst black women very heavily. And it was very fear-based. It was like, a, oh my gosh, you know, HIV is out there, and we've got to be careful, and, and everybody was suspect. And then relationships between men became strained, or even thoughts about dating became in this context of a lot of negativity. And, um, and I thought, you know, well, what can we do you know, when you have any type of fear-based uh, approach to something that is going to make the situation worse? And people kept saying, somebody needs to do a documentary, somebody needs to do a project. And I thought, well, I do film, I can make a documentary, why don't I do that? Mm. And so um, I started um, really on the pathway of research. I spent a year in research um, before I even embarked on making the film. I think as a filmmaker and particularly as a social justice advocate, you really need to immerse yourself in the topic. So I did everything from reading peer-reviewed articles <laughs> on you know, new medications mm -hmm. to going to conferences and of course speaking to people who are HIV positive. And um, it really started off uh, being about um, exclusively black women. I was going to make a piece called Sister Girl that was really gonna just focus on the impact specifically on black women. But then as I got into uh, more into the production mm -hmm. and started uh, filming, what I was finding is that people would sort of um, talk where these women were in families, you know, which of course now seems like <laughs> obvious, but um, it was really uh, the, the connection between the fact that this woman is connected to a family and a community that really sort of evolved it from just the conversation about black women in HIV AIDS to a larger conversation about the family. And so that's when it transitioned from sister girl to ending silence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they have faces they have families they yes, too yes uh, it's interesting when you talked about one of the things that attracted you to the work uh, were the alarming statistics from mm -hmm. Center for Disease Control because mm -hmm. it really relates pretty much to how I became mm -hmm. involved in the work uh, after having been in elected office for mm -hmm. over 16 years mm -hmm. I tried to decide really what I wanted to do and wasn't sure and being a social worker by profession mm -hmm decided I wanted to work on a cause, mm -hmm. C-A-U-S-E, mm -hmm. uh, social justice, civil rights, um, health issues. And when approached about this work and this position, it was really the statistics that got me also. Mm -hmm. I began to read um, a lot about the statistics and what the Center for Disease Control was putting out there. And also wondering why weren't there more people in my social groups, in my families, among my colleagues, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. talking about HIV, AIDS, and its impact, certainly on black women, but as well as the black community. Absolutely. So that's part of what got my mm -hmm. attention, and to hear you say that it was those numbers that uh, initially attracted you, and then the alarming numbers, certainly for black women. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, too, because it's some of the work that my organization is doing. And we also developed a video, Men and Women, One Voice, mm -hmm. and that's all about mm -hmm. black women. But one of the things that you did, of course, the approach you took in terms of developing the film was to interview people and uh, get them to share their stories. Was that very difficult? How did you find the people who would be willing to tell sure. their stories and share them? Because that's always a powerful way of people, you know, who have that story to tell. A absolutely, and and you you hit it right on the head when, um, because you know HIV is still the challenging thing for a lot of people to discuss. And so, for what what I did is I knew people for quite some time before we actually filmed their interview. And um, so that they would have a sense of comfort, you know, with me. So before you kind of just busting in with the camera, I really created a relationship with all of the, the subjects. And I'm still close to them. There's still people I consider, you know, my friends and family. And so at that um, particular stage, you really are... Um, you, you're gathering a very intimate story. You're, you're having people to remember a loved one that may no longer be here. And uh, so one of the stories uh, is about a little girl who actually passed away um, from AIDS at the age of three. And uh, mm -hmm. she passed uh, in, in, in 1993, and her name is Shadana Upshaw. And um, the uh, Laquita Parks, who was actually her aunt, 
is the first one who actually approached me. I, I was doing an HIV AIDS uh, outreach just discussion and she attended and she really wanted her niece's life to be remembered. The grandmother uh, was Shadana's caregiver and was not afraid you know, of, of Shadana, was really educating the family about how to properly care for this little girl. And, you know, and, and even Laquita talked about how at the beginning, you know, she didn't understand HIV and really kind of shunned, you know, Shadana. And then through learning and getting educated, realizing that when mm -hmm. she was actually more harmful to Shadana's immune system than Shadana would be, you know, to, to her and her kids. And so um, Laquita was the first person that said, I really want my niece's life to be remembered. Somebody needs to know that story. And then from there, everything was rather organic um, in terms of how people became a part of it. Um, there's another uh, story, uh, Vicki, um, who uh, I knew her for a year before we filmed her interview, and she had done a lot of outreach in churches. But when a person does an interview for the camera, that is going to live forever. And so you really have to yes. work with people and say, look, I'm going to treat your story with care you know, I, I, I'm not interested in exploiting or, or, you know, putting something there that isn't. Um, and so that comes from, you know, just taking a lot of time with your, your subject. And then so that by the time you introduce the camera into the space, um, people forget that it's there and that you're actually just having a conversation just like we're having right now. Mm -hmm. And I think you point out several points mm -hmm. and you make several points that mm -hmm. I think are worthy of highlighting mm -hmm. and that is trust. Yes. Trust and relationships mm -hmm. and the fact that you had spent time mm -hmm. building relationships so by yeah. the time you got to the point of wanting to do a video mm -hmm. you had the relationships yes. there, they trusted you mm -hmm. and they knew that you would be sensitive, mm -hmm. compassionate and caring about how you reveal the story sure. and how they themselves felt in terms of engaging. So mm -hmm. did you launch the video in New York or Atlanta? I don't remember In that. Atlanta. All the filming was done in Atlanta. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And so now where have you shown the film? Well, what the, kind of venues have you shown the film? Sure. Um, well, the uh, film originally went into um, a, a educational distribution in the fall of 2012. And so from that Point, um, I've done several community screenings. I did one last January at the um, at, in Washington D.C. for the inauguration uh, National Day of Service uh, Outreach Day um, with a uh, partnering with a church uh, start at Westminster. So that was in D.C. I've done uh, screenings in uh, Seattle, Washington, and then of course Atlanta. Um, but I know that there's been some other communities like in Arizona that have also used the film as part of education outreach and then the last uh, screening was actually at NYU on last February week, right? 7th yeah. yes uh, which is of course National Black HIV AIDS mm -hmm. Awareness Day and we had a tremendous turnout at the Center for Multicultural Education and Programs and it was phenomenal um, the uh, we had to bring in more chairs because people were so I guess it, you know ready for this conversation it was a very diverse audience and a uh, really nice way of introducing ending silence to the New York community because I really want to do more screenings at colleges and universities, uh, organizations, all of that. So I really want to, um, you know, see, you know, what Ending Silence can do to help end stigma. So before we talk more about the impact of, of stigma mm -hmm. and silence and shame, mm -hmm. especially in the black community, mm -hmm. how did you find the luncheon here in New York City where you have so many uh, individuals who've been involved with the AIDS struggle uh, from the very beginning, mm -hmm. ACT UP groups sure. who really led on this, mm -hmm. and organizations and black uh, activists and leaders. So how did you find in New York? Mm -hmm. Were you intimidated? Were you ready for New York? <laughs> I think I how was, was the experience? <laughs> you know, I think I was ready because, um, you know, New York is a very open community. Um, that and, is. and, you know, and I think that at least, you know, what I've discovered is that people are open to having the conversation. There's still parts of the country where we can't even, um, 
get a screening going because yeah. there's still so much stigma. And I don't think we think talk enough about you know rural communities um, that have very high HIV rates. That it's even harder. You know, the, our urban centers have challenges. But you know, for those people who are, you know, in South Carolina and Alabama and parts of Georgia who you know are doing that outreach work, it's really amazing because you know those are the places where it's the most difficult to have right. these conversations. But I, you know, New York has welcomed me with open arms. I, I've just um, I was really blown away by the receptivity of this for the screening. Um, it was all types of um, people there from all different backgrounds, all ages. And so I, I think that, you know, my thing is that I have a tool that I think can be used to humanize and to help and start a conversation. And so however, you know, I can, you know, partner and work with different organizations, you know, to, you um, use you know ending silence to really help and as and because HIV AIDS is a social justice issue for sure it touches on all of the issues um, in our community and, and as well as the larger sort of conversation and so that's you know what I'm hoping so to do. Here we are now mm -hmm. 30 years since mm -hmm. the Center for Disease Control uh, make known what yes. HIV and AIDS is yes and we certainly saw a lot of um, shame and stigma and we saw people being ostracized mm -hmm. by family, by friends. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit now about uh, the impact of stigma and shame as you have been able to see it through the work of this documentary, sure. your film, and the experiences you've had. Talk a little bit about what you're seeing and why is it still such a problem? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you say that because of course I knew in the making of, you know, because uh, it took me seven years to finish uh, Ending Silence. It was a long journey. And um, I knew that it was important work but I, 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 once it started getting out and I started doing screenings and, and having discussions with people, that's when I really knew how necessary the work was because we are losing ground in terms of people's basic knowledge around HIV and AIDS. I've done um, some discussions at some HBCUs, you know, or historically black colleges and universities. And, you know, the, the gamut of knowledge is still, um, oh, should I drink after my uncle? After, you know, at Thanksgiving dinner to, um, well, I hear that there's, you know, drugs that, you know, suppress the immune system. And so there's a very wide range of knowledge in, in one group around HIV. Like there's people who either know a lot or a little. And so I think it's a little um, challenging to discover, especially, you know, in the younger generation, that there is so little basic knowledge uh, mm -hmm. around just transmission facts. So I think as we talk about stigma, we, we still have to sort of uh, orient people to what HIV is and how you can and can't get it. I think we can lose sight of that. Um, and I also think that stigma is huge. I mean, I, I have conversations with people all the time about um, people being st are still being put out of families um, in, in our community uh, for an HIV diagnosis. And um, to me, that just in 2014 that we still have um, people being put out because they get sick is... is and it is, leads to people not wanting to even know their status. It, it, and that's it, one it, of the problems absolutely. we're certainly experiencing in the black community, yeah. people not even wanting to know uh, about their status. And sure. I know some of the persons you interviewed mm -hmm. talked about the role of the black church. Yes. And working with a number of black churches, talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what some of the suggestions have been made as to how the black church can help address and end stigma. Well, I think, you know, one of the things is uh, is getting a little bit more comfortable, and I know this might sound a little challenging, but a little bit more comfortable about the conversation around sexuality, you know, and acknowledging that, you know, sexuality is a part of people's lives. Um, and I also um, think that, you know, creating cross-gender dialogues and spaces, you know, um, this is where a lot of people gather. This is a place, you know, where, where the community can, you know, come together and, and have those conversations. And maybe, you know, uh, men have their own spaces and women have their own spaces and then there's cross-gender dialogue um, but I think that you know conversation is really important um, and I think that we have to be you know educating people as much as we can you know a around these issues but you know the the issue of shame is, is so um, intertwined and so many issues related to the black community um, that was one of the major themes that came out of the discussion on February 7th uh, at the NYU screening 
is how shame is a through line and that um, any type of illness, um, you know, even in my own family, you know, when people get, you know, diabetes or they have this, it's like a shame thing. It's like, oh, I'm a bad person because I got sick. And so how can we move the dialogue um, in health disparities, particularly within the community of, of educating people with, and removing the, oh, I'm a bad person you know, because I got sick or, oh, I'm a bad person because I did this or, you know, whatever, what have you. And, um, and so I think that, you know, in terms of talking about the shame and, and, and stigma in, in our community is that really when you're talking about HIV AIDS, you're talking about the things that we have a difficult time talking about, mm -hmm. family dynamics, uh, sexuality, um, you know, economics, um, you know, what are the economics of HIV and AIDS? And so it's, um, it touches on all the issues. So I think that if we can start in within the church, um, having these dialogues around um, all of these issues that we begin to just normalize the conversation around HIV AIDS. It, it is it is an illness, you know, uh, it, it is a virus, but it should not be a, a source of pushing people out of their families, communities, or churches because of a diagnosis. And education is ongoing because yes. one of the persons that I'm, I'm, I'm using the quote now mm -hmm. uh, in your film said that mm -hmm. despite educational programs in the schools mm -hmm. and communities about HIV prevention that people still don't take the problem mm -hmm. seriously mm -hmm. or take action to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So in doing your work, and I know you said you started out with women, but it went to sure. uh, black women, black gay men, mm -hmm. black men who have sex with men, mm -hmm. the black heterosexual mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speak to just briefly how uh, what you've learned through this process of how black women can mm -hmm. protect themselves and then the general population. Yeah, you know, and that's that's an interesting uh, conversation because I think it's very complex when we're talking about black women's sexuality. I mean, uh, you know, one of the conversations that we had, you know, even at the NYU screening was the fact that, you know, first, um, before you can even um, sort of negotiate uh, a condom in your relationship, you have to actually have a relationship with your own body. You have to re have an understanding of your own reproductive system and how it works. I, don't, I think we assume that black women know that they have ownership of their bodies when maybe that's not, a, you know, just a, you know, commonplace assumption that you understand your sexuality and 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 your how your body works. So I think that that's the first place. And then once we can have that conversation around, well, this is my body and this is how it works, then we can say, okay, well, what feels good? What makes sense? What feels healthy? Uh, does this feel safe? And then when women feel um, safer, then it, it then they can say to a potential partner, hey, you know, have you been tested, you know, for HIV, like, you know, um, do you respect boundaries? You know, do you, you know, would you be willing to go get tested? I think that those are dialogues that happen when people feel more secure um, within their bodies. And so I, I think that, you know, for black women, um, the conversation is multi-layered because you have to, one, own your womanhood, and then you have to own your sexuality, and then uh, know how um, to work with those things in, in your intimate partner relationships. No, I think that uh, because, mm -hmm. as I said, uh, when we began that mm -hmm. the National Black Leadership Commission race, we have recently launched a mm -hmm. anti-stigma uh, campaign where we are looking at the connection between stigma and the spread of HIV. Mm -hmm. Ending silence, shame, and stigma, HIV AIDS in the African American community, similar to the work that you're doing. So that's why I'm, I, I was particularly glad to hear that you would be available to come on the show and talk about that. And why do we think it's so important? The, because of the many reasons that you discussed here. Mm -hmm. Despite the education, despite what we know, we know that stigma and shame is keeping people from being tested. Mm -hmm. They are being ostracized, not only from family, but also by friends. Sure. And while it is against the law, there are still discrimination in employment mm -hmm. and other places. Mm -hmm. So if we can do more in terms of educating, and especially as you said, the younger people, they did not live through the early 80s sure. and the 90s when so many people were dying, friends and family members. So they didn't experience that. And there's a whole sense of complacency that if they become infected now, all they have to do is pop a pill. Mm -hmm. Not true. We mm -hmm. know HIV is preventable, but there is no cure. Sure. So we have to continue to educate 
educate, we have to continue to uh, agitate, we have to continue to mobilize, mm -hmm. and I think that with the work that you've done will lead the conversation uh, for a much longer period and take us into places where it needs to be heard. So in the few minutes that we have left, why don't you just talk to us briefly about what is the takeaway message that you want people to have um, as they listen to you, watch you, or even watch the uh, documentary? Well, the main thing uh, that takeaway that I would want uh, from Ending Silence or even for myself is that um, we are all human. We are all in the community. We are all in the family that uh, a person should not be, you can't, and you can't do anything to be put out of the community and the family, um, that everybody is a member. So regardless of your, um, you know, your sexual orientation, your status, your, who, who you are as a family, uh, family unit, as a collective idea, not just my individual family, but how I may relate to you, that you are in my community. And because you are in my community, I take care of you. And so um, I think the overall message, and I think people get that when they see the film, is that this is my uncle, this is my mother, this is my aunt, this is my niece, um, and so I can't stay divorced from it, that this is my conversation and I can own it and that it's okay. Right. That it's okay. So how can people who want to find out more about where to see the film, give us a... Uh, contact information really quickly. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, my um, you can go to my website. It's www.catchairsproductions.com, and that will have information about Ending Silence and upcoming uh, screenings. Well, you've been very, very helpful with a wealth of information, mm -hmm. and I just like to thank uh, Cat Chairs for joining me on today's program, where we discuss steps that we can all take to overcome the shame and stigma surrounding HIV and AIDS. For inf more information on this subject and issues related to HIV and AIDS, as well as other health disparities, please visit In Blackers website at www.nblca.org or look for us on Facebook and Twitter. The Manhattan Neighborhood Network brings these programs to you to better inform you, the viewer, about the important topics that impact your health and well-being. Please let your family, friends, and neighbors know about this incredibly important programming. Once again, I'm C. Virginia Fields, and I thank you for joining us and hope you'll tune in next time for In Blackers Health Action TV here on Manhattan Neighborhood Network.